Guns for General Washington. Chapter 25. What happened after? The minute General Howe saw the rebel cannon on Dorchester Heights, he knew the game was over. For a long while, with his redcoats and warships, he'd held the upper hand. But the colonists, those country bumpkins he'd once sneered at, had outplanned, outgunned, and outsmarted him. Now the British had no choice. Henry's cannon had roared, and the Royal Navy would have to quit Boston. But to save face, Howe tried a rearguard action. As the rebels expected, he made a half-hearted attempt to capture Dorchester with foot troops. A number of barges and longboats were assembled to carry the redcoats across the harbor. Then, just as the boats were being loaded, a fierce storm came up. The gale lashing the harbor was almost a hurricane, the kind of weather Howell feared. The barges were swamped, men were lost, and the commander called off the attack, which he suspected would have failed anyway. The cat and mouse game was almost over, and messages began to pass between Howe's flagship and Washington's headquarters. There were no written notes or details of what was decided, but historians believe that a bargain was probably made. The British agreed not to destroy Boston, and in return, the colonists allowed Howe's fleet to sail off unharmed. It took a few days to round up extra British ships for this move. And at last, on March 17th, the whole enemy armada scurried out of the harbor. With it went thousands of hated lobster backs. Howe also took along about 900 Tory sympathizers who had stayed in Boston under British protection. As Howe's sails vanished over the horizon, General Washington, with Colonel Knox at his side, led his victorious troops into the city. Boston was free at last and people welcomed their liberators joyously. Drums rolled, fife squealed, and there were happy celebrations everywhere, from the town gates to Boston's Point, from Clark's shipyard to Griffin Wharf. The wonderful news spread quickly, and soon refugees came pouring in from all over the countryside. Lucy Knox hurried from Worcester by fast coach to join her now famous husband. Cartloads of food also came rumbling into town to feed the hungry Bostonians who had been living on near-starvation diets. Later in the day, at an inn near North Square, the two old friends, Will Knox and Paul Revere Jr., had a grand reunion, and old Toby joined them to raise his mug of ale in a toast to liberty. Paul was eager to hear the story of the cannon trek, and Will soon had a wide-eyed mob around him as he relived a great adventure. The Boston victory, like a stone thrown into a pond, spread wide ripples across the city and towns of America. Everyone knew that there were years of danger and struggle ahead. The battle wouldn't be an easy one, but the triumph in Boston put new life into the young nation. It proved to the colonists that they could indeed defy mighty England and win. Colonel Knox, of course, was the hero of the hour, praised and congratulated by all. But as he pointed out to Lucy, he was too busy to take much notice. He had a thousand things to do, and one of them was to hand an exact list of his expenses during the long trip. Henry's final bill to Congress for hiring drivers, horses, and oxen, buying rope, tackle, animal forage, and so on, was 520 pounds, 15 chilies, and eight and a half pence. So in colonial money of that period, the journey cost about $2,500, a real bargain, considering that it may very well have saved the American Revolution. And that's the end of our story. I hope you enjoyed Guns for General Washington. Thank you so much for listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.